H&M is the official partner of the Fashion and Color podcast, partnering with Harlem's Fashion Row for two years in a row for our Sustainability Summit. H&M is revolutionizing fashion by turning recycled materials into breathtaking, eco-conscious collections, such as Heron Preston, to reshape the fashion landscape through collaborative efforts like the H2 Collection. They are not just crafting clothes, they are crafting the future of fashion. Today's guest is a true icon, an icon and an icon maker, I should actually say too. And not just the stylist, but he is an image architect. He has dressed some of the most iconic figures in Hollywood, including his really good friend, Zendaya. And I say friend, not client, because I know yeah. that their relationship Sister, yeah. goes deeper than that. Celine Dion, and Anya Taylor-Joy. And even though he announced his retirement from styling in 2023, and I left a comment under that Instagram post as well, like all of us like, no. He's still making headlines and continuing to shape the industry through his new book, which I have right here, which is How to Build a Fashion Icon, and through his new educational platform that he has for up-and-coming fashion stylists. Welcome to Fashion and Color Podcast, Law Roach. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so <laughs> excited. Like I mentioned to you before we got started, you have been killing it. Thank you. With this book tour. I mean, and I feel like because we look at your Instagram, so many of us already feel like we... We're so familiar with you, yeah, right? So yeah. I'm sure you go going to different places and people are like, oh, you're already my friend at my head. Oh, yeah. How has it been? Um, no, it's been great. It's been it's been really amazing for me to be able to be surrounded by the people. Um, you know, like this press tour is, is really similar to like um, press tours I've done for movies with, you know, with clients because, because of all the travel and appearances. But it's like for me, um, it's so grounded and humbling to be in these places because literally I did um, the Howard Theater. I think it was seven, eight hundred people, and I literally stood and I signed every single book. Wow! Took every picture, hug, kissed people. Was Facetime their mamas. You know what I mean? Like, oh and so it's just goodness. like it feels so good to be to be surrounded and immersed um, back with the people. Did you did you know you had that much love like I did out not. there? Did you know that I did. like we were like rooting you on. All of us got on like our pom poms, and like... I did not. I really didn't. I even with the retirement announcement, um, I had I wrote that that day because I was just I had felt like I had just hit a wall, and I actually wrote it so funny because when I did that, I didn't I didn't really necessarily know or think that I was going to retire. I just wanted people to stop calling me. <laughs> like I wanted the phone to stop ringing. <laughs> you know whether that had been for uh -huh. a day or two. But it just it it turns into something so big and became such a, a news you know a news story. That I'm like, oh wow, people people not only in L.A. and New York and Chicago, but people around the world globally really care about what I'm doing and who I am and um and, and for my well being really. And so that kind of gave me this metric of you know how loved I was, mm -hmm. which which was so surprising, and that's carried on through. The book tour and like every other thing I think I've I've done since. It's like people don't always miss you. Like you know, you're just like you don't you don't realize what you got until it's gone. Yeah. And you gave us a taste of oh I could be gone. Yeah. And we were all like, oh, <laughs> yeah, includes in there because I was like I was just you know once I figured out like oh I really do want to walk away for real. I was like you know what sis I I can't do it anymore I just. I have to figure something else out. Well, I'm not I never happy. knew she was in the equation. Oh, for the she retirement. was in the equation. Very what? yeah. She called me like, "Are you crazy?" She like, "You lost your mind." I got, I got these two movies coming up. We got Doom, <laughs> got challenges. Like, so go ahead, take your little break and really? and get ready. Oh but, my yeah. goodness! So you were yeah. really like, I need I was a minute. Done, done. I yeah, need a minute. I really was. What have you done to be able to just take that moment for yourself? Like, oh. how do you? What's your routine like yeah. now? Like, how is it different from well before you retired? Writing a book actually was really therapeutic for me because okay. once I did 
make that announcement, I started to figure out that I didn't know who I was outside of that, mm. outside of being La Roche, the stylist, image mm-hmm. architect, you know, and, you know, associated with this person and this person. I really started to feel like I really didn't have an identity. Mm-hmm. So then I started to mourn mm-hmm. all those things. And I really went into like a deep depression for a couple months, mm-hmm. just trying to figure out, you know, was there another road for me? Was there anything else I could do? Did I have another talent? Did people want to see me in another arena? Um, and so going through all that and then I, and coming out of it, writing a book helped me come out of it. Cause you know, in the mm-hmm. book, which is not a memoir, but there are some very personal stories um, and anecdotes from my life and, and, and my work. Um, it helped, it really helped me heal. Mm. It really did help me heal, and it gave me purpose, and then it, it it let me be creative again, and so it was it was a big thing. And then I also learned in that process that happiness is a habit mm. um, that has to be I worked on. That. You have to work on it. Like yeah. it's not you know given. You know you have to wake up every day with um, with a drive to be happy, and you have to remind yourself of that, and you have to constantly work on things that make you feel that way. So yeah. just like working out, you know, and eating right and everything, happiness is also a habit that has to be nurtured and cultivated and and supported, you know. I'm going to tell you what was really interesting uh-huh. when I started reading your book. I don't know what I was expecting yeah. at all, yeah. right? But I'm reading this book and it is a complete page turner. It's reading me. By the way, like uh-huh. there's so much wisdom uh-huh. in there. There's so much like food for the soul in yeah, there. Yeah. So what I, the title is really deceptive because I wanted people to think that it was a book about fashion and what you should wear, what you shouldn't wear, and all that. And really, it's not. I tried to, you know, hide the medicine and the ice cream sort yeah. of thing um, because really, it is a book just about how to find the ultimate confidence, whether that's using you know, using fashion and using clothes to do that. But it's it's not a fashion book, you know, at all. At all? <laughs> it's so good. Yeah, too. thank you. <laughs> yeah. It's so good. So in 2019, mm-hmm. we honored you with our Stylist Award, which yes. was one of my, my highlights for yes. sure. Um, and I just remember kind of, seeing like even at that point in 2019 like yeah. you were killing it yeah like you were killing it and then you went from there and the pandemic happened yeah. and then i just felt like your star I just never kept <laughs> rising I, I worked through the pandemic i never stopped working like i just never stopped which let me you know i talk about it in the book too about burnout and trying to find balance i never stopped i think i went back to work um, I went back to work at like the end of March. I like literally was on a plane with going to Miami and it was like me in front and one person in back and like one flight attendant. And you would go through the airport and it'd be like four people in the whole entire airport. So yeah, I just never, I never stopped. I never gave myself a break. I never even thought about it. Um, it was just, it was, you know, I felt like I, one, you know, in this country, you're not, you almost feel worthless if you're not if you're not working yourself to the bone. It's mm-hmm. like, oh, girl, I'm so tired. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. oh, I've, done, I've worked, you know, 60 hours this week. I'm so tired. It's almost like a badge of honor mm-hmm. to be overworked and overwhelmed. Yep. And, um, and that's the way I was. You know, it was just like I was saying yes to everything. You know, anybody who called, I felt flattered that they wanted to work to me. No matter, I, even though I had reached this status, it was just like, Yes, yes, yes to everything nonstop. And so I think all those things kind of contribute to, yeah, 2019, 2020, 2021, 2022. I just never stopped. Never, oh ever stopped. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I mean, I think I went through that. And then I don't know when it hit me. Maybe about, I don't know, maybe five years ago uh-huh. when I slowed down quite a bit yeah. because I was working constantly. And I didn't even have to work constantly. I mean, law. I was doing decks for brands. They were not checking for me or HFR. Yeah. But I was still staying up yeah. all night doing these decks. And finally, I was just like, you know what? I need some balance. Yeah. And I need some rest. Yeah. And it was good for me. But it's also important to figure out what balance means to you. That's true. So now, for me, it means like like I'm working so hard promoting this book. 
And when that gets to a certain place, then I'll take a month or two off yeah. and just, you know, relax and do whatever it is that I want to do for me. Right. Even though this is for me, but just like for my mental, for my physical. Yep. Um, so, but like, I, I can't, I never want to try to preach and tell people what balance should be. Yep. Balance is whatever you figure out, whatever you figure out works for you. Yep. It's what you should do. So when I think about you, I think when we all think about you, uh -huh. we think about pure confidence. Yeah. Has there been a moment where you didn't feel confident? Yeah. Well, you know, I I had to have confidence as a young boy because first of all, I've been very feminine my whole life. And I also was born with the last name Roach. So yes. you can imagine <laughs> yes. growing up with those two things, you know, two things that could have really been defeating yep. uh, for me. But my grandfather told me, he was like, you know, Nobody ever forgets your last name. And then I also figured out like nobody would, you know, love it or hate it or being teased or not. Still, people never forgot me. Yeah. So when I started to think of it that way, I just started to build confidence at a really, really young age. Um, but when I retired is when I had that mm. that kind of um streak of being not confident. Like I said, I didn't I didn't know who I was. I, and I was like, well, why would people still like me? And you know, I've, I've met so many things to so many people and so many people look up to me and like all these, all my fashion kids and, and I didn't tell anybody, nobody knew that was happening. So people were calling and shocked and, you know, I had a whole staff, I had six assistants wow. and, you know, it was just like, I'm retired, y'all got to find something else to do. Wow. And, you know, and then I felt bad about that. You know, yeah. I was in charge of people's livelihood and supporting them. It was just like a lot. And so that's when I was like, I don't know what to do. I don't know who I am. I don't know what my next move is. And so it was, that's, that's probably the biggest um, and the most memorable time where I felt like I lost confidence. What brought you out of that? Like, was it a phone call? Was it a book? Was it a, um, a routine yeah, that you started yeah, doing yeah, differently? Yeah. You know, really, it was really, um, so I have a house in Georgia that has a lot of trees and nature. Mm -hmm. Thank God for it. And I would just really walk out every day and just like get up in the morning, take a walk, walk around the property and just be grateful. Mm. So it's the attitude of gratitude that mm -hmm. brought me out of it. It was like, I'm grateful for every experience I ever had, good or bad, because they taught me something. They shaped me. Just, you know, grateful for the peace that I was able to find in that sh this stretch of time when I wasn't, you know, giving myself to other people and pouring all of me into somebody else and just really gratitude. Like, you know, I'm healthy. And, and once I start to come out of depression, I'm like, I'm happy. And then I became so grateful for that. Mm. So yeah, it was just, it was, it was really just me. I always say I therapeutic myself because people are like, you didn't, you didn't get a therapist. I'm like, no, I did it myself, <laughs> which I don't recommend. I'm not saying right, that's the right, best thing, right. but that's what worked for me. Right. Um, and yeah, it was just, it was just really, really just being grateful and also being still. Yeah. People don't understand the power of just being still. Because when are we able to just be yeah. still? Yeah, and I got, yeah. I had the luxury to do that. I love that. Yeah. I love that. Now, I know you went from a vintage store owner in yeah. Chicago to an image architect. Did you see that path? I know you talk even in your book about like, setting a vision for what you want to see for your yeah. life, like envisioning the things that you want to uh -huh. see. Like, was that something that you envisioned? And I believe it was, um, it was one, of, was it one of your clients, but it was a woman who was like one of the best dressed women, I think in Houston. Yeah. Yeah. If yeah. I'm not mistaken, That's but right. I think she was the one yeah. who inspired you to, to move. move. Yeah. So she, it was so funny cause she, she, I had met her um, at the venture store. She kind of became my godmother, godmother Eunice. And she's always telling me stories about um, she was, you know, in the circle and it was like her and Tina knows. And she's always telling me, she's like, I used to be the sharpest one in the party. And then Tina knows will come in <laughs> and she was so sharp. And so she told me one day, she said, you'll never win the game if you're not in the stadium. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes when people tell you that you have that, that, that thing goes off and I'm like, you're right. And I think a couple of weeks later, I, um, I packed up everything and I moved to L.A. Wow. 2014. Yeah. Wow. I always say I'm from Memphis, Tennessee, 
And I'm like, I could not have done anything like Harlem's Fashion Row in Memphis. No. It just wasn't possible. I wasn't in a stadium. Yeah, you wasn't in a stadium. So when people reach out to you now and they're like, I really want to get into styling and I live in Birmingham or yeah. like, oh, is your advice to them to move? My advice to, to people is to figure out what type of stylist you want to be. Okay. Right? Because some, depending on what type of career you want, maybe not. Okay. You know, maybe you'll be okay, you know, wherever you are. You know, there's money wherever we are. There's some type of industry yep. wherever we are. It might not, but if you want like a career that mirrors mine or maybe some of the other people that you're going, that you're having on, it's like, you can't just, you can't, I couldn't, I couldn't be, have become Law Roach, this Law Roach in Chicago. Right. You know, and I also said this in the book, one of my favorite quotes from mahogany is you don't you don't make it in Chicago you end up in Chicago mm. and so it's like all these things that mm -hmm. that um that I had heard or, or have been said to me you know is what pushed me to move but yeah it's you you have to know what type of career you want right and if in and, and if that is the stadium if that's New York if that's yep. LA if that's Paris or you know Milan or whatever then yeah you have to you have to get up and go and when you moved, when you packed your bags, yes. what was that process like? Was there hesitation? Was there fear? Was there... Uh, you know what? To be quite honest, I I had no fear because I had met Zendaya in 2011. Okay. Well, she was still on Disney, but, you know, she was, she was young. She would do a few things here and mm -hmm. there. And then I had also start going to New York and lying out saying I was a stylist. Mm -hmm. Like I, I went to New York and I got a, a a 646 area code just so that I could be like, people like, are you local? I'm like, yes, I live here. Uh -huh. I live in Brooklyn. <laughs> yeah. Just lying, you know. <laughs> um, and so I started working with, a lot of people think Zendaya was my first client, but my actual first client was Kay Michelle. Okay. The uh, R&B. Who's from Memphis. I, yeah, yeah, uh -huh. yeah. She was actually my first client. And so I, I, was, I had started working and making a little money um, but I would work, I would try to work on doing the weekdays and then go home and bartend on the weekends because that's what right. really, you know, took care of, you know, the bills and everything. And so, um, I really didn't have any fear. I just, you know, I was like, you know what? I know I can do this. Um, and not only can I do it, I know I can be good at it. And I wanted to be considered one of the best. Yep. And so I just went out there. I went, I went. And just kept working. Started working. I just never stops. That is not <laughs> easy. Yeah. And look, I I moved to New York with two suitcases and a duffel bag. Um, I had a place to live for two weeks, and that was it. I didn't know yeah. what I was going to do after that. So I understand feeling like you got to go. Yeah. I was like, I just have to figure it out. Yeah. But I don't know if I had as much confidence. Yeah. I definitely had. There was definitely some doubt there, like, oh, my gosh. What if it don't work out? I just kind of had to. I think that's get those human. Voices though. Out of my it's head. human. Yeah, that's all human. Yeah. Like you're gonna have that, but you you can't let that take over you. Yeah, I always say no fear. You know, no fear. What's your relationship to Chicago now? Um, I am um, all of my sensibilities and my hustle, um, and even some of my style is all rooted okay. in Chicago. It's it's all rooted in Chicago. I don't. Go back as much. I, I did have a, a book conversation there that was really, really great. Um, actually, and it was down the street from my old vintage store, so it was okay. like a full circle moment. But, but every part of me is is the way I was raised in Chicago, how I was raised in Chicago. You know, the men in my life, uh, family, and like even like the men in my life, street wise, mm -hmm. right? Um, growing up around a certain type of a certain type of person and being really in the streets like all of that built and shaped me for sure <laughs> i'm so i am chicago <laughs> sh through and through <laughs> um what are some things that you wish i'm gonna go into you as a business owner uh -huh. Uh -huh. right you say you had six assistants yeah what are some things you wish someone had told you about entrepreneurship like, yes, yeah. you're a stylist and an image architect, uh -huh. but you're also an entrepreneur. No, I always looked at it as a business. Yeah. People was like, oh, you're so, I mean, you're so, it must be so great to be a creative. I'm like, no, I'm a businessman. Right. So I've, I've always ran my business as a business. Yeah. Um, the early in days, people, I wish somebody would have told me about taxes. Yeah. 
Because yeah. that was, you know, that was a big problem for the first couple of years. But yeah. even at the School of Style, we t we have a whole elective on on financial literacy um, because that was one of the things that I was missing. And I know that's a lot of things that freelancers just don't get. Yep. If you're not coming from that world, I think it's more accessible now than it was when I started. But at the School of Style is one of the things that we want to focus on and make sure that people understood things like, you know, what type of corporation you should be, you know, what is a loan out, you know, um, advising them to to if, get a business manager and, and have somebody to deal with the finances, especially if you're more of a creative brain, right? Yep. You need you need that, that somebody to balance that out. Um, but yeah, it was it was mainly the financial stuff. Yeah, <laughs> that I didn't get the business. The business I kind of started to understand as I went on, you know. And also in the beginning, I wish people someone would have told me that that you manage things and you lead people. Mm. So early, I think early on in my career, I was you know I was a little bit more tough and harsh. Mm -hmm. And but you know I I came from the streets. I didn't right, know, right? You know, and so when I figured that out, is that you have to lead people, and when you become a good leader, you get more out of people than you trying to manage them. Where did your wisdom come from? <laughs> like, what are you reading? What are you I'm listening reading to? I'm not reading nothing. I was just, I'm a student. I'm a student of the world. I'm a student of the world, and I listen. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, and I listen to to people. Like, mm -hmm. I listen again. I, I grew up in the streets, and so you know. You can get wisdom when you're in the streets. You get wisdom from any and everybody. Yeah, yep. somebody got a story. Yeah, you know, somebody has a lesson to teach you. And I think a lot of my lessons came from that. And yep. just, you know, just really paying attention and and being uh, present yep. when you're when you're in conversations with people and talking to people. And I don't just hear people. I, I am an active listener. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Okay, so you talked about school of style. Yes. Tell us about that. Like, how do Who's invited to be yeah, a part of School yeah, of Style? Yeah. Well, School of Style is, is an open invitation to anyone who wants to pursue a career in, in fashion styling. Um, and I'm really so proud of it because it is, we acquired the business, me and my partner, Kent Belden, who owns the only agency, the agency I've been signed to for, uh, it's been like seven or eight years now. Okay. And so we acquired the business together in COVID. Um, it was an existing platform where they did this in-person um, um, styling, well, um, sessions every six mm -hmm. months, I think, like in New York, and then would be in LA. And it, it was really successful because I had a lot of assistants, interns that mm -hmm. came through School of Style. Mm -hmm. um, but I think what they, they made a mistake is, you know, COVID, you had to be able to pivot. I think you had to be able to be nimble and to pivot and, and they quite weren't. And so we bought the business from them. And so what we wanted to do was to update it and make it more current. Mm -hmm. And the previous owners weren't, uh, they weren't really in the industry as to the, to the same level as mm -hmm. I am. And the first course um, is introduction to image architecture. So what mm -hmm. you're gonna get is the infrastructure that I built for my business and the ways I did it and the the nuances of, you know, of being Law Roach and how that how I was able to kind of like penetrate the industry yeah. and actually disrupt the industry. Yeah. So you'll learn that and and then there's a lot of um a lot of industry professionals that, that are coming on to teach electives. I so we that. have the financial literacy elective and then we have like um, Brett Nelson, who styles Doja Cat, mm -hmm. and Sabrina Compser, he's going to come over and teach the the art of music video styling. And Mae Riley is going to have a course on street styling. And so we're bringing all these people so that you can get a, a well-versed education. But the best part about it, and the most things that makes me the most proud, there's a lot of educational platforms, right? But they can't promise you, yep. or they, they can't even make a close promise that you'll be able to find some type of employment so after you're certified you go into a database and you kind of push into this pipeline oh, where wow. you know even if you are in memphis okay. and say there's a stylist that's working and they come in to memphis there's a database to say oh where a school of style graduate is in memphis they would love to intern and assist and so we can always keep the conversation going and help them find employment that's because cool. what after completion, you go into this thing called Style Society, which is a, a, 
a real true community yep. um, of, you know, people that's taking the class, networking, fellowshipping with each other, and also job postings and things like that. So, and, and you'll just be looked at at the agency. You might be further along than some people. And so it might be time for you to get an agent. Yep. And so it's just kind of, what it does is it shrinks the gap between your dream of being a stylist and actually realizing that dream. I love that. Thank you. I know there's so many people who listen to this show, who watch this show. It's yeah. also on YouTube. And they want to get into styling. Yeah. And the fact that you're giving them like a tangible way to be able to do yeah. that is incredible. And it's, I mean, it's collegiate level cost coursework like i really put my all into it we hire some really smart people um the way it, the way it's set up it's uh it's it's really i think i'm so proud of it that's I all i keep it. saying it looks I'm so beautiful. proud of it thank you it looks absolutely beautiful yeah. i know you also have a capsule collection that's coming out with pepsi yes can you tell us about uh, it? is it still under wraps uh, yeah, you know that's <laughs> okay so another thing again when i was when i was retired it was like in that healing process, I started to like, what else can I do creative? And, you know, Pepsi came in and that's such a nostalgic Americana company. Yeah. And um, they kind of was like, well, you know, we want to do something. You could do whatever you want. And I remember my grandfather drank Pepsi and, you know, we used to be able to drink uh, Wild Cherry, you know, mm -hmm. Pepsi. And, and you know, it's like everything was based off nostalgia, the taste of it. Mm -hmm. And um i remember watching like roller derby with my with my grandfather and like all these tough women like doing backflips and and so that's what it's based on it's like it's a um, um, homage to to things that felt nostalgic from my childhood so you see like the the 70s type of satin bomber jacket mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. you see the wild cherry logos on like Love on the it. butts you know it's Love very it's very yeah. so it's cute it's nostalgic um you know something to kind of like throw on if you if you are in the skate culture or yeah. you know you just want to throw something on like trucker hats and you know it's it's cutesy and where are we gonna be able to buy <laughs> this cutesy collection oh um, i think it's gonna be um somewhere on pepsi.com okay yeah okay yeah, yeah, okay yeah. you've traveled all over the world yes right yeah um, like what place has inspired you the most mm. um inspire me the most I, I would say Lagos when I got to go to, so I had been to Africa before I had been to South Africa, but when I felt like when I went to Lagos, like I felt like I was in Africa mm. for the first time. Mm -hmm. And you know, us being African-Americans before you go there, you have so many misconceptions and we've been thought to think that Africa was a certain type of way. And and when I got to Lagos, it was just like, you know, everybody was like, oh, you're Nigerian. My brother, welcome <laughs> home. You know, I love it. Uh -huh. And it was so it was just so amazing to to be somewhere and to see all everybody look like us. Mm -hmm. Everybody in the airport, all the police, like all in mm -hmm. every restaurant, like everybody was us. And I, I went with somebody who wasn't us. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it was so it was so amazing because they were so dismissive to him. And so wow. we we were able to have a conversation. I'm like, well, you, s and I knew he felt a certain type of way. Yeah. I was like, the way you feel now is the way we felt in in our country mm -hmm. since we've been there. Exactly. All and the it time. was the first time that he really had a chance, I think, to have a true empathy for mm -hmm. what it's like to be black in in America. Mm -hmm. um, because they would we would go to a restaurant, and you know, he was like, can we have a table for two? And they was just like. And then I'll say it. They'll be like, sure, brother. Come, let me show you to a table. They were so dismissive. And I was like, the the cunty part of me, I loved every uh -huh. minute of it. Because I'm like, here's this white man getting a taste of what is what, what? is what mm -hmm. we go through still. Mm -hmm. You know, you can go to a, a restaurant and be the only black person there and you can feel yep. you can feel that yep. that that, you know, not all the time, but a lot of times you can depending on where you are, yep. you can feel that like what is she doing here or mm -hmm. what is he doing here. Mm -hmm. So and he got a lot of that. And so we, on the way back, we had a, a real conversation about it. And I was like, well, how do you feel? He was like, you know, I just felt, you know, that I felt invisible and mm. I felt not heard or not seen. I said, mm. congratulations. <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> welcome, welcome. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, when you think about your book and you think about all the chapters in that book, yeah. what's the one piece you're like, if you don't read nothing else in this book, read this chapter? Oh, um, 
I think for me, it's a it's about um, taking risk and not being a not being afraid to start over. Mm. Are two main points in the book that that are that weigh heavy on me, because you know sometimes we get stuck, mm -hmm. almost like I felt stuck. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not saying like, oh, you hate your job, go quit your job. You know, no, because then you're gonna be don't be calling but, Rose for a job. But it also, in some cases, it is. I hate my job. Let yeah. me go quit my job, yeah. right? And it's like figuring out figuring out what your risk tolerance is yeah. and what that means to you. But and just not being afraid to not being afraid to pick up and move, not being afraid to start a new career, not being afraid to get out of a fucked up relationship. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's like. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid to just don't be afraid to start over in whatever whatever that means and whatever world that is. You understand right, what I right, mean? Right. So that those are the two things that 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 really I want people to take away from it because you know you'll just you'll just be stuck in something. Yep. Um, like when I retired, I felt the same type of way. Like like I said, like people are not gonna like me no more. You mm -hmm. know, like I'm not gonna have any other things and. Had I not, had I not walked away from that or the, that it at that capacity, mm -hmm. then this book wouldn't have happened. Mm -hmm. School of Style wouldn't have happened. You know, I've been doing some acting, some you know, some improv and like all these things that I've always thought that maybe I could be good at. It just would never have happened. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I, I just I I urge people to really take those lessons and and tailor it to yeah. have, to make it fit you and your life. When you look out at the fashion landscape right now and you see where we are as a people in fashion, yeah. are you are you feeling hopeful? Like what are you thinking? You know, there are some black designers that are doing well, mm -hmm. right? More than we've ever seen before, I think. Yep. Uh, because I think when I first when I first got into the industry, it was Tracy Reese and no one else. Yeah. You know, and now we have, you know, Laquan and Christopher and um, Sergio and uh, Hanifa. And we have all these people that have really built sustainable businesses. Yep. Um, that's really great to see. But, you know, it's we still are always at the at the bottom of the the line, mm -hmm. right? To to get the funding, to get the investments. Um, you know, and I, I you know, I'm grateful for People like Aurora, with, with with what her, you know, her platform and what she's doing, and all the money she's raising, and trying to change that. Because I always say, like, nothing really changes until you can change somebody's financial situation, yep. right? That's when the change starts to happen. Absolutely. When when the money starts to flow, right? Um, but I, you know, we went through, you know, after after George Floyd and all that, everybody wants to do everything for black people. It was like we were like we were hot, hot, <laughs> we were hot. Like yep. you, you, you want that? <laughs> of course you can have it. You know, and then our industry, fashion, moves by trends. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Even with the trend of like being body, you know, size inclusive and body positivity, you see that trend is going away. Yeah. You know, um, and we still don't have the representation we need inside. You know, in in, in the decision making room. So I think, I mean, although you want to be optimistic. You know, it's just like the things are what they are, but that's why we need think people like you and and the work that you do, and you know, hopefully, some of the work that I do. That we just got to keep doing the work. Yeah, absolutely. Like across the board, we I'm looking at like Pharrell and the new theme of the Met Gala, yeah. and you know, I'm I'm sure the influence that he had on that. Yeah, and hoping that even that pushes the needle forward. Yeah. We'll take us. it, you know, all the everything we can. We'll take all of it. Uh -huh. Um, what is something that we don't know about you, Law? Something I want to know. Something you haven't talked about in any interview. I don't know. I think I talked about everything. You, you talked about a lot of stuff. I talked about role. I talked about everything. I talked about you know. What's um, one thing we don't know about? Like, what's something that people just wouldn't expect? That I'm nice. <laughs> You know what's so so do people so do people do are people expecting something different? Yeah, but I kind of I, I you know I spoke about this too. I kind of created that that persona of being mm -hmm. not nice mm -hmm. in a way. You know, I just I think you know being too nice and 
and too accessible to people be, could be a distraction, mm. right? And I said it on Sherry Shepard, it was so funny. She thought it was hilarious. She was like, well, you know, you, you always so serious. You're so low, low roach to diva. And I said, yeah, I did that because I didn't want you to invite me to your birthday party. <laughs> and I thought if, 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 if you didn't like me, then you wouldn't invite did it, me. Did it help? No. And then I wouldn't have invitations. to go. Right. And if I didn't have to go, I wouldn't feel bad about not going. You couldn't make me feel right. bad about not going because right. you didn't invite me anyway because right. you don't like me. Right. So, I, you know, I built this persona of being like kind of like, you know, walking in, you know, hi, how you doing? Very that. And, you know, and, you know, and I, I think it worked for me to keep to keep the blinders. I love it. So I never got I never got, you know, in a click or, you know, did too much or too much, too much socializing. It just kept it kept it helped me to have this guard to almost protect me, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, but when people get to know me. They like, oh my gosh, you're so sweet, you're so nice. I'm like, don't ever tell anybody that. <laughs> you know, my my right. fashion kids know. Yeah. They they get to see that. They yeah. they get to see that very nurturing side of me, but they also get to see the tough love. Like, yeah. like they, I call the people now. Like, and when I hear they hear them do something, I'm like, I just heard you did what? Are you crazy? Right. Fix it. You know. Wow. And and they get to see it. And, and but now now that I'm kind of more relaxed now people are gonna be like oh my god you're funny and people are like you're so sweet i'm just like you are it's you okay. absolutely are it's okay now i love it <laughs> well thank you so much for thank coming you. on the fashion and color podcast everyone who's looking make sure Please. that you go and get the book how to build a fashion icon yes because this book is a page Turner. It is absolutely incredible. It has a little bit to do about fashion, but most of it is really about the deeper stuff. Yeah, it's about building the ultimate level of confidence, the kind of like, fuck you confidence. <laughs> this is it. Love it. Thank you so much, thank you This has been amazing. Me. Thank you. Thank you so Aww, much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Fashion and Color Podcast. I want to thank our production partner, PBA Entertainment, the Harlem's Fashion Row team, thank you so much for your support of Harlem's Fashion Row and for your support of Designers of Color. Please be sure to leave us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform and be sure to share this with a friend. Welcome to the HFR movement.